Welcome everyone. We're so grateful that you could join us tonight um, for this, our January fireside chat here at the Library Company of Philadelphia. Um, and by here at the Library Company of Philadelphia, I mean on the Library Company of Philadelphia Zoom. Um, my name is Allison Kronstadt and I'm the events and programming coordinator for the Library Company. I really enjoy uh, overseeing all of our events and programs, our public events and programs, um, of which we offer many. Um, and I encourage you to visit our calendar page on our website to learn more. I'll also be putting some information into the chat about some upcoming programs that we have. Um, the Fireside Chat series uh, is one of my particular favorites that we do with the library company um, because it's a really amazing opportunity to highlight scholars who have recently published work based on the research that they have done in the reading room at the library company. Um, and it's wonderful to see how our collection items uh, make their way into folks' work, which then makes its way into the world. Um, so to speak a little bit more about the library company and to introduce tonight's uh, featured presenter, um, it's my honor to introduce our librarian emeritus, uh, James N. Green. Um, so please take it away, Jim. Hello, everyone. So um, uh, before I start, uh, before I introduce Rodrigo, I would like to um, tell you a little bit about the library company. I think we're probably a lot of people from California who are tuned in now and who might not know about us. So bear with me for a second. The Library Company of Philadelphia is an independent research library, which preserves something like a million um, rare books, prints, photographs, newspapers, magazines, ephemera, manuscripts, documenting every aspect of American history and culture from the 17th through the 19th centuries. It's a research center serving a national and, interna and international constituency of scholars and its exhibitions and programs like this one are open to the public free of charge. The library company is also America's oldest cultural institution. It was founded in 1731 by Benjamin Franklin as a subscription library, uh, which is what you what you called a circulating library, a public library back in those days, um, uh, uh, it was supported by its shareholders as it is to this day. From the Revolutionary War to 1800, when the national government was in Philadelphia, it served as the Library of Congress. Until the 1850s, it was the largest public library in America. The library company's collections grew with the nation and reflected the country's many faces and varied interests. All the books the library company acquired year by year over more than two and a half, well, actually now close on to three centuries, are still on our shelves, along with many others added since it was transformed into a research library in the 1950s. So that's who we are. Um, this evening, I'm absolutely delighted to introduce to you Rodrigo Lazo, Professor of Latin American and Latino Literature at the University of California, Santa Cruz, who will be talking with us about his recent book, uh, which has the wonderfully bilingual title of Letters from Philadelf Philadelphia, I hope I'm saying that sort of right, Early Latino Literature and the Trans-American Elite. I first met Rodrigo in 2005 when he was a fellow at the Historical Society of Pennsylvania and the Library Company. And he came to talk to me about the question at the center of his research, which was why and how were so many of the earliest works of Latino literature in the first three decades of the 19th century published in Philadelphia in Spanish. We discussed at length this fascinating archive and the many questions it raised, but after I, that, I heard nothing from him for 15 years. And so for me, it was a thrilling experience <laughs> to read his book and realize that he had answered every single one of his questions and mine. It's a special pleasure to host him virtually here at the library company because it turns out this is one of the great hidden Philadelphia stories. Though in Rodrigo's hands, it's not only a story about Philadelphia, but above all, about what the idea of Philadelphia meant to Latino revolutionaries and exiles and what opportunities it afforded them. Letters from Philadelphia was the winner of the 2021 Early American Literature Book Prize, and he has published several other books and articles on related aspects of trans-American Latino print culture. 
Rodrigo is himself a trans-American personage. He was born, did I say trans trans-American Latino print culture. Rodrigo is himself a trans-American personage. He was born in Guayaquil, Ecuador, lived in Puerto Rico for a couple of years, and then moved to Los Angeles at the age of eight. Before becoming a professor, he attended Columbia University School of Journalism and worked as a reporter for the Miami Herald. Then for nearly 20 years, he was a professor at the University of California, Irvine, before assuming his new post at Santa Cruz last fall. Congratulations, Rodrigo. Please welcome Rodrigo Lazo. Thank you, Jim. Thank you for that very nice introduction. You were reminding me of uh, various things in in the past that I sometimes forget have happened. But yeah, I uh, uh, have moved around a bit. And I um, uh, want to start just by thanking uh, you, Jim, and Alison Kronstadt and the library company for having me uh, for a fireside chat. This is a very special invitation because, as um, you'll see in a minute, I uh, my research really took uh, uh, took hold there while visiting the library company. And um, I don't know, Jim knows um, uh, how important he was to my project uh, by helping me really understand the importance of the commercial aspects of print culture at the time and how a lot of these publications were uh, woven into the work of printers and um, booksellers uh, in uh, Philadelphia in this period. So um, both Jim's scholarship and some of the references that he gave me were uh, were very, very important. So um, thank you for that. Um, and uh, um, I also want to welcome and give a shout out to the students from my 19th century Spanish language literature course who are uh, joining us and are reading some of the materials I'm talking about in Spanish this uh, quarter here. So uh, welcome to all of you, and I hope you get maybe get inspired to go to the library company yourselves at some point and do some research. This evening, I'm speaking uh, from the University of California, Santa Cruz, which is the unceded territory of the Waswa speaking Yupi tribe. The Amamutsun tribal band comprised of the descendants of indigenous people taken to mission Santa Cruz and San Juan Bautista during Spanish colonization of the Central Coast is today working hard to restore traditional stewardship practices on these lands and heal from historical trauma. That is the official land acknowledgement of UC Santa Cruz. And as you just heard, it references Spanish colonialism as part of the history of the land on which I work. Spanish colonialism is also a part of the history behind the book Letters from Philadelphia. Uh, so let me now share a PowerPoint and I'm gonna take you through some of these aspects of this book. Uh, As I argue in this book, Philadelphia was an important publication center for Spanish language materials in the early 19th century, uh, in part because writers who could not publish their work in the Spanish Americas made their way to the city in order to connect with printers. Some of these writers were forced into exile and some remained in Philadelphia or the United States for decades. Hispanophone Philadelphia reminds us that the Spanish language has always been a part of the history of the United States. And not only in the territories that were formerly a part of uh, the Spanish Empire, such as Florida or the U.S. Uh, Southwest or uh, California even, but also in the revolutionary period of the Americas in a city that is more usually associated with U.S. independence. I would situate this book alongside Maria Lozano's In American Language, The History of Spanish in the United States, uh, and other books that are recovering uh, an important dimension of U.S. history uh, in Spanish language with print culture, uh, with a print culture emphasis, including Carmen Lamas's recent The Latino Continuum and the 19th Century Americas. So my book, uh, 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 what it does, in, uh, unlike some others, is that it really takes Philadelphia as the, as the central uh, place of, um, of print culture at this particular moment in the early 19th century. It turns to Philadelphia with an F rather than the, uh, the Anglophone spelling, because that is the way that um, uh, many of the writers and intellectuals in my study thought of it in terms of a, a, a city, not only uh, with material conditions, but also uh, an imaginative space. So how did we get to um, Philadelphia or how did I get to Philadelphia? Um, one of the ways that um, scholarship begins often is we'll see something or read something that uh, catches our attention. Uh, and in 1995, Arte Publico Press published an edition of the novel Hikotenkal. It is an 1826 novel 
that, have, that was published in Philadelphia in Spanish anonymously. It's a small book, two volumes, roughly five by uh, three inches. Um, and this book was at the time for sale in New York and uh, three different locations in Philadelphia, including the Franklin Institute, which um, immediately tells us there was a book buying market uh, in the area, which is something that I came to learn about more and more. This new, uh, this new edition of Hikotenko that was published in 1995 was part um, of the Recovering the U.S. Hispanic Literary, Lit Literary Heritage Project, an ongoing effort to locate, reprint, and study writings by Latinos in North America going back to the colonial period. In the introduction, professors Luis Leal and Rodolfo Cortina wrote several uh, uh, pages contextualizing the site of publication and included numerous Spanish language titles and the names of writers uh, and uh, different government operatives that moved, uh, passed through Philadelphia and published works. That got uh, me interested in trying to find out more, spending some more time with these books. And I came to learn that uh, others had um, uh, considered this or at least framed it in terms of in relation to Philadelphia. Uh, uh, for example, in the mid 20th century, the Venezuelan historian Pedro Graces uh, called this group the Philadelphia Cir Circle or El Círculo de Filadelfia. So I was very interested in this uh, material, in these materials. So in 2005, I applied for and received a fellowship from the library company and the Balk Institute. And I was able to spend some time at the library company uh, reading some of the books in the collections. Now, mind you, this, um, this was uh, before the internet, uh, or rather before um, a lot of digitization uh, emerged on the internet. Uh, so at this point, it was still necessary to, uh, to um, go to uh, look at the physical copy of many of these books. Since then, um, many of them have been digitized and are, and are available now. Um, but at that point, uh, the library company provided invaluable uh, support with its collections. Um, before I um, say a few more words about uh, Philadelphia, I just want to note an important part of the kind of research that we do in, uh, in relation to these areas and how some of it is something that we need to continue to study and to build. The novel that sparked my, my interest in Philadelphia, Higotenka, um, has also been part of a very, very lively debate going back decades about um, who wrote it, because it was, uh, it was not only um, uh, uh, one of uh, an important part of U.S. Uh, literary history. Uh, it's also considered a very important part of uh, Spanish language publishing in the Americas because it's one of the earliest novels. Uh, it published in the Spanish language anywhere uh, in the Americas. And so uh, scholars in Mexico and many other countries have historically wanted to know, well, who wrote this and, uh, and, uh, and why, right? So there have been many debates um, with many different um, uh, people proposed as possible authors. And you see this, this edition here, Hikotenka, um, uh, they, they have identified the author as Felix Varela, uh, who was uh, there at the time. Um, but some year, when my book came out, um, I, I, I had a section in it in which I, I argued that I did not think it was Varela, that it seemed like it was part of a different kind of publishing circuit, that it was more almost like part of a book selling effort. Um, and not long after that, the, the scholar Maria Barrera Agarwal, um, uh, Ecuatoriana Tambien, has located, she located information that the author Cayetano Lanusa or that, Cali, that Cayetano Lanusa was the author, not Felix Varela. So that's the latest information. If you want to read more about this who done it um, publication, uh, the latest issue of um, Early American Literature has several articles on this topic, um, uh, by one by Maria Barrera Agarwal. So, um, but the the important point that I want to uh, take a, a, as we think about the rest of the material that I'm going to talk about is that Cayetano Lanusa. Um, was more of a, a printing impresario than, than an author. He was somebody who, was a, he, who ran a kind of small publishing uh, venture called Cayetano y Lanusa, and they published books in Philadelphia and New York and sold them. So he was really part of more of a publishing circuit. He also published a, a, another um, novel that we know of, and, uh, and he published a magazine in Cuba later. But So he was part of kind of publication and writing, but um, I definitely want to connect Cayetano y Lanusa to um, to publish the publishing industry, if you will, of the early uh, 19th century. Okay, that's a little bit of a, of a digression, but so I, let us return then to uh, La, La Famosa Philadelphia. 
Um, so in the uh, in this early period of the 19th century, um, many uh, many of the writers and intellectuals who who went there called it La Famosa Philadelphia. Now that can be translated as famous, um, but that word famosa functions more like celebrated or well known. Um, and and among those who opposed the Spanish Empire, um, uh, it emerged as this you know celebrated place because it set an example for uh, revolutionaries fighting uh, against European colonialism. So it was almost like uh, if Philadelphia was the site of, in, uh, of the Declaration of Independence against England, uh, uh, the Spanish American intellectuals, some of them saw that as a potential place for um, uh, the uh, anti-colonial battle against Spain. Um, so there was a kind of a discursive construction with Philadelphia with an F, right? Uh, as the wars of independence uh, were breaking out in Spanish America, uh, what we do today would call Latin America, just imagine um, uh, different types of uh, political operatives and writers, uh, uh, intellectuals, professors, philosophers, um, uh, making their way to what they viewed uh, as a revolutionary city. Not only a national city of the United States, but uh, really an, an anti-colonial inspiration for the Americas and the world. Philadelphia emerged as a space of liberation from, uh, from colonial holdings. And, but it was also for them an actual city that they could visit and admire. So it was a, and it was a print culture center. So let me say a little bit more about each of these three parts. It's a symbol um, that they take up. It's, a, it's an actual city where they travel and they hold that as, uh, as something to uh, celebrate. But it's also an important place where uh, print takes place. And I'm going to give you um, three slides now that will take us through through those three aspects of the way uh, uh, they viewed uh, Philadelphia. Okay, so the symbolic function is evident in the prologue to Vicente Rocafuerte's Ideas Necesarias para todo pueblo independiente que quiera ser libre. This book is actually a collection of translated documents from uh, going back to the U.S. Revolution. It includes a translation of Tom Paine's Common Sense, uh, a translation of the U.S. Declaration of Independence, a translation of uh, U.S. Constitution, translations of U.S. constitutional documents. Um, so uh, in the prologue, he actually situates all of these translations as something that uh, he can send out to uh, the Americas as a way to, uh, to provide a, almost a sample that can be then uh, emulated. Uh, and here I quote, and this is my translation of what he writes, I have the Spanish for you. And where would I find memories more sublime, lessons more heroic and more worthy of imitation and situations more analogous to our actual political situation than in the celebrated uh, Philadelphia. In this case, memory, the memorias, right? It's more of a reference to history as memory, meaning the US Revolutionary War. And, uh, and in positing an analogy, Rocafuerte was recommending that the newly independent countries in the Southern Americas modeled themselves on the United States. As such, this book, which circulated in Mexico, there was a, a, an edition published in Mexico two years later in 23, um, contained these, uh, these documents, almost like really carrying political theory and political thought from one part of the Americas um, to another. So keep in mind here that Translation was an important part of, uh, of uh, the work that many um, intellectuals did in Philadelphia. So when writers translated something like Common Sense or the U.S. Declaration of Independence, they were trying to carry those ideas across the continent. Uh, so that, and I would say that in this case, the symbol of Philadelphia is very much um, con connected to constitutional principles. As the decade went on, the decade of the 1820s, uh, many countries in Latin America were debating how to establish new constitutions, and some of the other materials that come out of Philadelphia are very much connected to these. Uh, how do we organize the new uh, the new nations that have emerged in Latin America? But they were also interested in the city itself. Um, Philadelphia was very much a material place, okay, a, a, a living lab of republic republicanism where. Uh, people could walk around and actually see what a place like this looked like. In 1824, the poet Jose Maria Heredia sent a letter to his uncle in Cuba recounting a walking tour of the city. 
Uh, here, Edenia describes various places, various buildings as he walks around, talks about the layout of the streets. Um, and in an interesting turn, he compares the, uh, the first U.S. bank uh, to the Parthenon. Okay, so what, and one of the things that he says is that it's really the most beautiful building that he has ever seen. He's like uh, uh, enjoying just, you know, uh, the air as he uh, stands on the uh, steps leading up to this building. And he says that he doubts, and I'm translating here, that the Parthenon, even in its moment of greater luster, could rival the bank in simple elegance and beauty. So one of the things that we see there is just very much a kind of anti-colonial framing, right? This idea that Philadelphia as city can stand up to uh, to Europe as uh, as an amazing city that um, that it, uh, that is part of uh, a kind of American uh, American revolutionary tradition that crosses um, from one part of the Americas to another, um, as opposed to. Um, uh, Europe and its, you know, much older cities that were venerated by certain people because of uh, of of a kind of urban mystique, right? So here we have an example of an urban center in the Americas that um, that also has uh, many many great things to to complement it. So again, this becomes a, a very material reality for the writers that um, can then be uh, taken and transferred over to. Uh, Latin America, as its, its its countries are fighting for independence. The third aspect that I want to emphasize is Philadelphia's print culture center. Okay, it had um, at that point uh, Philadelphia was um, was still one of the uh, really the most important printing center in the United States. Uh, New York becomes much more important um, uh, a, later, a little bit later, but. Um, at the time, there were just dozens of printers in uh, in Philadelphia, and this was the kind of place where um, writers who had some resources could uh, could make arrangements with printers to uh, print a book. Um, in some cases, these were projects in which the writer would pay for a run of the books and then try to transport it to uh, a country um, in the Southern Americas. In other cases, there were books that were published to be sold in um uh, both locally in Philadelphia and New York, but also um, and, on an international stage. And someone like Ayala Dano Lanusa that I was mentioning for a while was very much uh, involved in that kind of selling of books. Here I'm giving you um, two examples of books that um, that were published in Philadelphia uh, where the, the print situation there allowed these writers to um, to to uh, to really release this work. So the, the one on... On the right is El, Triunf El Triunfo de la Libertad sobre el Despotismo. And just to give you the, the kind of variety of, uh, of these books and titles there, this is a, a, a very, very interesting book by someone who was forced into exile. Um, uh, and uh, and he it, it, what he actually does in this particular book is to um, make an argument against monarchical rule using theology, particularly the Old Testament. So um, this is uh, someone who has um, studied uh, um, the Old Testament at length um, and uh, really deploys that and, and cites many passages from the Old Testament in order to say, no, the Bible does not um, uh, support a monarchical government and the um, the king is actually a despot. So it's a uh, it's a very, very uh, biblical argument that um, uh, that that he develops there. Um, the second one, the 1823 Cartas Americanas, the full title is actually Cartas Americanas, Políticas y Morales, um, etc. by um, Manuel Lorenzo Vidaurre, who's um, from Peru, also has to go into exile. This book is a very interesting collection of different um, essays that uh, the short pieces that have everything from debates about constitutional principles, uh, a piece against slavery, and then there are these um, uh, letters that are inserted in there that are actually love letters to his sister-in-law. It turns out that this gentleman, uh, Vidarre, had had an affair with um, his sister-in-law and um, decided that in Philadelphia he could publish these letters and go public with this love that he had for his sister. And they're all mixed in in there. So you, at one point you're reading about constitutions and in the next one, it's a love letter. So um, he thought himself as the Peruvian Rousseau or was known that way, people called him that. So again, you see the, the kind of the, the variety of the different types of books that 
um, that, that were printed there. And the other reason why Philadelphia was, uh, was important was because of uh, censorship um, in uh, many parts of, of the Spanish America. So um, in Spanish America at this period, um, right before um, the uh, Wars of Independence, printing was restricted in several ways. So number one, there were actually a limited number of presses. Uh, there were some places that, uh, some cities that today we would consider major cities that did not get presses until uh, um, really late in the 18th century or early in the uh, 19th century. Um, other places like Mexico City had had a history of, of printing, but not all the cities in uh, Spanish America. So there was a limited number of presses and um, and writers needed to go elsewhere to publish his book. London was also an area, a, a city where um, uh, writers published their materials. Number two, in order to, uh, to print a book in Spanish America under colonial rule, um, uh, people needed to get licenses to, to, to be a printer, but also licenses to publish a particular book. So there was a certain amount of control um, uh, exerted by colonial authorities. Uh, number three, there was a certain amount of um, uh, censorship from the Inquisition in which uh, people connected to the church would read material and then either ban it or, uh, or take, take it away from people. So um, just one of the, something that I have up here on this slide uh, uh, involves um, one of the, um, one of the, really the more notorious cases of, of this kind of censorship. It's, uh, it's, it, it's related to a book um, called El Desengaño del Hombre, or Man Undeceived, by Santiago Felipe de Puglia, uh, an Italian immigrant who in 1794 published one of the earliest Spanish language books out of uh, Philadelphia. Uh, and this book is, as you can imagine, challenges uh, the entire Spanish monarchy because it's, uh, it's really an argument against divine right, the divine right of mo uh, monarchies. And so the Inquisition banned this book. And, um, uh, and then this, what you have here is a picture of, a, of the broadside that was you know, possibly uh, put up in uh, some part of Mexico. Um, and the library company acquired a copy of this broadside. Uh, banning the book. So um, uh, the bright side is itself a very energetic piece of writing, accusing Puglia of being haughty, disobedient, blasphemous, treacherous, and, and then they even call him a monster. Um, and according to the edict that they handed down in this broadside here, um, anybody with a, a copy of this book, El Desengaño, uh, the nombre would be excommunicated and also fined, right? So uh, you can see how there was a, a certain amount of just res the restrictions in um, some of the uh, parts of, of Spanish America were such that there was a real uh, sense of uh, Philadelphia's offering an alternative that they could not get at home. Uh, Manuel Lorenzo de Vidaure, whom I was talking about uh, a minute ago in his book, actually ha has a scene um, in Cartas Americanas, in which the um, censors from the Inquisition come to his house, and he calls, you know, they're looking around for books that he might have, and he says they they were like rabid dogs, is what he calls them. So again, there was a, a certain amount of um, of uh, uh, um, uh, just uh, limit certain limitations that prevented writers from just you know uh, getting out their work. I want to say something about these um, trans-American movements. Um, something I try to connect here is how uh, political movements, in this case against colonialism, Spanish colonialism, uh, were connected to the physical movements of uh, the writers and intellectuals, um, by which I mean migration, right? So it's, there's movement in terms of the political operations or political um, uh, uh, organization at the same time that we have migration as a kind of, uh, as another kind of movement. Um, and then the third kind of movement that I think connects here is the circulation of books, because something that uh, they were trying to do uh, was to move books, uh, all of it going beyond like uh, the organization of the nation, right? In terms of um, if we're gonna cross, then things were crossing constantly from uh, one, plane, uh, one place uh, to another. Um, something for us to reflect on is that today, um, even in academic fields, there continues to be a hold um, of, uh, of a kind of thinking that divides the United States from, uh, from Latin America. 
Um, and even in our uh, uh, in our organization of academic fields, there's American studies and there's Latin American studies. But this material is uh, a reminder that at different points in history, these divisions were not as uh, as solid or not as uh, influential as they are now. Uh, many intellectuals here saw themselves as uh, uh, really part of the Americas or part of an, an American anti-colonial process rather than just being part of, uh, of, of one nation. Um, so that as we think then geographically about people moving from one place to another, we might consider how we, uh, how we uh, analyze books that were moving from one place to another. So if we, if, if we return to um, a, a very influential model that I find helpful in, 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 in thinking through some of these questions is Robert Darnton's communication circuit. Uh, in which he talks about a kind of process, but you know, which starts with the writing and includes the printing and the book selling and then the uh, the readership. And where where are all of those? What happens if we think of a communication circuit um, in an international form, or in this case, a trans American uh, approach in which a book might be written in one place, published in another, and then uh, sent uh, to uh, somewhere else? Um, so, for example, uh, some of the letters in Cartas Americanas were written in Lima. And then Vidarre goes to Philadelphia and pub publishes the book there. And then the book may be circulated in other parts of the Americas. Or Rocafuerte wrote some of the uh, 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 some of his letters in, in his book um, on constitutional principles um, and then uh, published it elsewhere and circulated in Latin America. So you see how um, often uh, writing, printing, and circulation may be uh, crossing uh, from one country to another. Sometimes all in all three are in different places. Sometimes uh, uh, you know somebody may write something and print it and then send it uh, send it something else. So this movement is what um, inspired me to think a little bit about uh, letters or cartas um, as a as as a way to think about this material. So my title, Letters from Philadelphia, is a play on the Spanish cartas, which appeared um, in the titles of so many of the books, and I've put some of, uh, some of them here. So the Spanish carta is influenced by um, an Enlightenment association with an, an epistolary claim as a way to address a broad reading public, right? So uh, there are many books in the French and Anglophone traditions um, that also use the te terminology of the letter, or the uh, carta, right? And the, one of the ones that's closest to us uh, work in, in, in American literature, broadly conceived here, um, is Hector St. John the Crevaker's Letters from an American Farmer. So um, what you have here is uh, the letter as a kind of book that uh, is addressing someone, um, but is also in some ways taking up a variety of topics. That's why in the book that I was talking to you about a minute ago, where it said, well, there's a letters, love letter next to a, a constitutional you know, letter about constitutions. There's that kind of mix because the the, the book of letters or the book of cartas um, is usually taking up many different kinds of uh, of topics, right? So it's not just one, one particular um, aspect uh, that we see. Um, uh, so, in terms of the ones that that I have uh, that I have here, um, uh, and again, these are very very different in terms of what what they contain. The different kinds of uh, some of them are much more political, uh, and some of them are uh, are are linked to um, uh, someone trying to make a very very definite um, uh, appeal to readers in another place. Cartas al Pidio by Felix Varela. Uh, which is on the list here, is actually um, sent to Cuba where it doesn't um, get a whole lot of attention. So uh, Varela writes this um, letter um, very much to go to, um, uh, to, uh, to Cuba and to the youth there. He thinks of it as a book for young people in Cuba, but it doesn't get a whole lot of attention. And yet you can see that for Varela, who had also published another uh, periodical called El Habanero out of Philadelphia, he um, really thinks of his work then as circulating far outside the uh, where where he is um, ultimately settled, which is Philadelphia and then New York. Um, the, the this issue of letters also I think moves me a, a bit closer to uh, the questions of intimacy. Okay, so uh, the whole notion of sharing letters. Um, uh, were, were, uh, was also connected to notions of bro bro brother, the brotherhood and friendship. 
um, in, uh, in very much in this enlightenment sense, fraternité. Uh, and, uh, and so there's this very much of a kind of intellectual discourse among men. It's a very male-centered kind of uh, uh, exchange, um, uh, but it's uh, it gets past the like outright political uh, functions of this into this en ele uh, elements of intimacy, right? And so it becomes very kind of like a, a kind of close um, uh, uh, address. And yet I find that then Cartas navigates that sense uh, and it closes the gap between what we might think of as a distance between writing from somebody writing from one country to another. But if it can sound intimate enough, if it can feel like it's addressed to uh, a specific person, um, that helps us close the gap, right? So the letter implies a distance, but it's because the letter uh, is usually written to a specific person, it can also uh, uh, help to close that gap. Many of, many of the letters um, here, even when they're published in books to a general readership, are you know have a kind of address that uh, that implies this kind of closeness. Uh, one of them is uh, "Don querido mío de todo mi corazón," which we can translate roughly to "Dearest beloved who holds all of my uh, all of my heart." Right. So you can see that there's this closeness, or or they'll sign off with "QSMB," which is um, you know initials for "Que su mano besa," who kisses your hand. Uh, so there's this kind of uh, sense that it's very much a kind of decorum of a part of a, 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 an exchange of ideas. So um, as you might imagine, um, how somebody made uh, uh, his way, and, and, it, and it was mostly men, right? So uh, uh, how they made their way over to um, Philadelphia um, involved the, the need to have some resources. And so many of the uh, participants in this culture were either uh, wealthy or uh, were connected to families that could uh, could um, uh, could pay for them to be there. Um, and in some cases could pay for their own run of books. Vicente Rocafuerte um, was an extremely wealthy man who um, was highly educated and um, uh, eventually became president of Ecuador after uh, after his time in Philadelphia. But um, he would travel all over Europe. He was a, uh, there, there's a letter um, uh, from him to a U.S. congressman at the Historical Society of Pennsylvania, um, very much plugged in. So, if you, you know, you can imagine he was uh, going to Philadelphia. He had connections there. He knew people. He was a, a very well, uh, well-placed uh, person. So, um, in this, in a different way, Jose Maria Heredia, who wrote our Philadelphia letter, um, uh, uh, his family was mostly in Cuba at that particular moment, and he was being funded by an uncle who actually had a coffee plantation where there were slaves. So uh, Heredia was opposed to slavery, as, as were most of the participants in this, uh, uh, in La Famosa Philadelphia, but um, but the, his family was still connected to that, and, uh, and clearly he was... Um, uh, uh, you know, benefiting from uh, the uh, slave economy in Cuba. So um, I, I point this out because I ultimately find that it's so important for us to uh, consider uh, the, the, uh, the, the social position of these writers and intellectuals when we are analyzing their work, um, in part because it raises some uh, really, really important questions about what was left out of the Philadelphia writing and what did this connection that they had to La Famosa Philadelphia, uh, what was it based on and what was not included as part of that? So one of the things that um, I argue in my book is that um, uh, in trying to build a kind of uh, celebration of Philadelphia and celebration of the United States as the ultimate you know, example of anti-colonial success, many of the writers overlooked conditions for enslaved people and indigenous populations in the US. They mostly steered clear of those kinds of topics. Um, uh, again, they would state their opposition to slavery, but they were they would not, uh, for example, talk about the conditions for uh, enslaved people or, uh, or even uh, free blacks in, in the United States. And, and at times they would only paper over um, the, the relationships with indigenous people. Um, uh, in addition, the Philadelphia discourse allowed for a kind of abstract notion of uh, of, a, uh, of constitutional government that cut out um, the local conditions in many other countries. So, uh, for example, 
Um, when, when writers came from countries with large indigenous populations, some of them who didn't speak Spanish, that matter was not considered, right? It was all very much like we're going to we're going to have a constitution that um, that uh, that mirrors um, the the abstract principles as uh, as articulated in uh, in something like the U.S. Constitution. In addition, I um, I also just have already noted that cartas, the letters, this discourse of was very very male centered, right? And so um, uh, at times you uh, you can really see that there was very little. Um, in the way of a kind of uh, self-reflection on on those particular issues, um, uh, and and the result is that uh, I do think that um, the 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 amazing contradiction or one of the amazing contradictions of uh, the writings that come out of uh, La Famosa Philadelphia is that they recapture the spirit of Philadelphia as a kind as an anti-colonial uh, and revolutionary site that was uh, of great importance importance. At the same time is that they teach us how emphasizing just a kind of abstract notion of uh, of, 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 of a citizen allows for um, uh, political theory to overlook what the specific conditions might be uh, in a particular location. So I'm going to stop there. Uh, I would love to hear some questions from you um, and also some comments, uh, especially if you have anything to say uh, about um, Philadelphia, if you have knowledge about Philadelphia, I always love to hear um, what others have found. I know there are um, uh, different aspects of the city, I think, that might even be related to some of um, uh, the material that I've been talking about here. So uh, please share your questions and comments, and I'm going to uh, shut down the PowerPoint at this point. All right. Thank you so much, um, Dr. Lasso. That really I'm amazed by how many different areas one thread can touch on. And I think you did such a good job drawing all of those out. Um, one thing I was really struck by um, that I was hoping you could speak a little bit more about before we get into some questions from the audience um, is sort of your use of framing language. Um, so there are, you know, a lot of the term uh, Latino itself is much younger than a lot of the time period that is covered in your book. I'm wondering uh, what made you decide to use that word and how you think sort of tracing Latinidad older than the term itself uh, can help us understand both the time period of your area of study and this time period today. Thank you. Um, yeah, that's uh, 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 an important part of my work in part because Something that I'm trying to do with uh, the figures in this book, with many of them, is pulling out, pull them out of a nationalist his historiography. So let's take, for example, Jose Maria Heredia. My students were reading Heredia on, uh, this week and last week, and um, Heredia is often discussed as a Cuban poet. He's he was claimed as the great nationalist Cuban poet in the 1930s, um, and very much framed as the poet of Cuba who kind of, who articulates a kind of Cuban sensibility. Uh, well, I didn't actually, he did have great love for Cuba. He actually spent very little time there when, when you considered his uh, his years. He died at a young age of 36. And during that time, he um, lived in, uh, he grew up for a part of his youth in the Dominican Republic. He spent more than two years in the United States. He lived out the last part of his life in Mexico. He is really more of a trans-American figure than a solely a Cuban figure, or as I like to claim, somebody who's part of the U.S. He's a I consider him a poet of the U.S. He publishes his uh, first first edition of his uh, collection of poetry in New York in 1825, um, and travels all around the U.S. and writes, you know, uh, poems about Niagara and Washington and all kinds of different U.S. locations. So uh, the interesting part of that is how do we consider um, Heredia as part of U.S. literature? Um, and not only as part of Cuba, right? And so I think that uh, the term Latino or what today pe people might want to use is Latin X um, or Hispanic, you know, some people still prefer that term. Um, what that does is it really allows us to see the connections 
uh, between the different sites that these writers uh, move, move in. So um, I think uh, if I could just go back, since uh, Jim brought up a little bit of my own background, I'm a rosary from Ecuador. I still consider myself Ecuadorian, but I'm also a U.S. Latino. I grew up here. And so I think a lot of us inhabit multiple identities as we cross these territories. And that's, I think, something that you uh, see very much in these writers. And I want to I, I want to carry that conversation in relation to um, Latinidad as a, as a predominantly U.S. frame. Thank you so much for that. Um, so another question from an attendee, um, to what extent, if any, did individuals from the Spanish speaking, from Spanish speaking populations and countries experience discrimination in Philadelphia? So that's a great, great question. And there's some moments in the book where, where I know like specific places where uh, people might have said disparaging comments. So um, talk about like the kinds of different experiences that people might have. And I think this happens to uh, um, a lot of uh, a lot of these elite writers in the 19th century where um, in their home countries, they may have been viewed as white um, uh, and and granted a kind of racial privilege uh, based on that. And definitely privilege because of their economic situation. But once they get to the U.S., they're viewed as um, some kind of other, either uh, you know, Spaniard or Cuban Spaniard or uh, named in some other way. And sometimes some of that can be uh, disparaging in part of because of the historical tension between um, uh, England and um, Spain and this whole notion of the black legend, right? So, uh, so there are moments when um, uh, people will make disparaging remarks about them. Um, and um, so that's one of the great, that's one of the great contradictions of how uh, coming to the U.S., um, places people in situations that um, that where they lose some of the the ease which where they which where they they might have moved in their own countries uh, or the language itself also the English language right so at any I was fluent in Latin and Greek and you know uh, um, but he had a really hard time with the English language and he was constantly complaining that it just you know he couldn't quite get into it so um, you know that made it difficult for him as he was traveling and all that. Absolutely. And then just to follow up on that, um, I'm curious how a uh, religious difference might have come into the picture, um, both in terms of interactions within Philadelphia and also, if at all, how that sort of contextualized uh, these folks' understanding of their revolutionary struggles, uh, both as similar and different to uh, the revolution in the United States. So the example that I would give there that's very concrete comes a little bit about after his time in um, in Philadelphia. So Felix Varela is actually a priest. He studies a philosopher priest. He published his books on philosophy in Cuba before he comes to Philadelphia. And then um, ultimately he leaves Philadelphia and he goes to New York and um, uh, has a parish there and uh, uh, works in a parish in New York, uh, Manhattan for many years. And uh, once there, he's um, he's getting a kind of double um, discrimination, both as a Catholic, but pro from Protestants, and also as uh, you know, as a, as somebody of um, uh, of, of Cuban Sp Spanish background. So, um, uh, and there, th there were moments in which uh, you know, religious uh, religious conflicts arose. Um, the the one thing that I would add is I don't do a whole lot of this in my book, but there's a very very lively publication of Spanish language Bibles in, in the early 19th century. That's an area for some uh, important research to be done for somebody who really wants to run with that. It's like um, you know who's publishing the Bibles, where are they sending them, whom are they whom are they for? So um, so so that's another very uh, important uh, important area. But there are um, interestingly enough, though I will add one more thing. Manuel Torres, who was um, uh, very well placed in uh, Philadelphia and uh, published some books there. Um, he he um, was part of uh, uh, one of the Catholic churches in um, in Philadelphia. I want to say it's St. Mary's, if, I, if I'm remembering correctly. And there's actually a plaque there for him. And for a long time, he was kind of viewed as part of the history of that, uh, of that parish. That's so cool. And that sort of continues to... Um, pull out the ways that you can see the imprints that these individuals left on the physical landscape of Philadelphia, which can be seen even today. So 
Um, that's a really interesting little tidbit. Um, we have a quick demographic question, uh, which is how large was the Spanish speaking population in Philadelphia in the early 19th century? That's a, 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 an excellent question that I've spent some time uh, 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 just fretting about, and I haven't been able to quite put, put a, a, a number on it. Um, uh, it it might have been it wasn't a lar a huge population, but it, you know at any one time it might have been um, uh, anywhere from uh, up to a hundred to a couple hundred. It wasn't it wasn't a huge population, but at, at the time. Um, the population of Philadelphia in the 1810s, 1820s wasn't that large either, right? So um, I don't, I, I, I'd have to go back and look at all the numbers, but I think we were talking about a city of about 50 or 70,000 people. Um, so, uh, um, so it wasn't huge, but it was, it was definitely sizable enough that um, that uh, 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 there was there were interactions and there were houses where people gathered. Um, it was really part of an early um, immigration to Philadelphia that. Um, becomes much more pronounced later in the century, where when Puerto Ricans start coming to Philadelphia, and by the 20th century, there's some uh, really large communities. So this was the this were some of the earliest examples of that. Um, and one other thing that I would say is that um, in relation to that, some of these publications were driven by um, a, a book buying public that wanted to learn the Spanish language. There's always been a certain amount of uh, interest in books. Uh, from uh, from Spanish speakers or people who, who are learning Spanish. And so uh, someone like Heredia uh, brings that up even in the introduction to his co collection of poetry, saying this is also published for those who are learning Spanish. Thank you so much. Um, we have a sort of two-part uh, question, comment, um, that actually, Jim, uh, I think you might be able to weigh in on a little bit, although... Uh, Rodrigo, I'm sure you have some information as well. So we have, thank you so much for this enlightening talk. I'm wondering how these books and broadsides came to the Library Company of Philadelphia. So um, yeah, Jim would be uh, would be the person to answer that. Um, uh, and uh, and I, I would follow up with that. It's like, uh, Jim, can you remind me that broadside that we have there from uh, the Inquisition? Was that something that you acquired while you were there? Um, yes, it was. Because I remember you were, <laughs> we had this great moment where he says, oh, look, I have this amazing uh, broadside here. Yeah. So, um, yeah, a lot of them have been uh, bought in, in you know, modern times, uh, partly because of uh, there's an interest, there has been an interest in this kind of material, not only in on our staff, but also by there's a local bookseller, um, a bookselling firm, um, I think now um, um, retired, but David Shevchek of Philadelphia Rare Books and Manuscripts Company is um, probably the country's leading authority on the bibliography of um, Spanish language printing in America. And um, we bought a few of these things in modern times from him. I don't, I think we might have bought the, the, the Inquisition broadside from him too, but I can't remember for sure. But also, um, there's another aspect of this, and that is that one of the publishers, one of the main publishers of these uh, books in the 18 teens and 20s, with Matthew Carey and his son Henry Charles Carey, um, the firm of Carey, uh, Carey and Matthew Carey and Sons, Carey and Lee, probably at that moment the largest um, literary publishers in America, and he um, was. Uh, one of these people who um, who had this um, who, who set his eye on this uh, South American market for reasons that are a little bit mysterious. I think maybe you could maybe you found something about that that you could say to me um, because I don't think he ever made a lot of money from um, from selling these books, but I think he also had some kind of a, a almost globalist um, uh, mm -hmm. um, ambition to take American books, his books, in fact, all over the world. He sent um, he sent agents to Calcutta, to Canton with um, with his books. And he also sent agents to uh, Havana and to Mexico and and Valparaiso and uh, Buenos Aires. So um, he was so interested in this kind of trade that he had a lot of these books in his own library, which came to us in, when he died in 1839. 
So um, whether any of these books were actually, uh, say, available for loan in the library company, you know, when they came out is a question I can't answer. It's, um, I, I, it's, it's, I think, more of an interest that comes from not from the generality of our readers, but from certain people who were, you know, using the library company and, and as their um, sort of collected library. Yeah, definitely with the Matthew Carrier, what I, I very much took it uh, the Latin his um, excursions into Latin America, and I believe that was even the term that was used. It was something like excursion in his um, in his account books. He called um, them adventures. Ventures, ventures. Ad, that's ad, what adventures. 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 Ad, yeah. Um, <laughs> uh, the, um, th those were part of a much broader, right? Because as you say, there was Calcutta, there was uh, some uh, different locations. Um, I was really interested, and uh, if any of you want to know more about this, you can. There are parts in the book that get into is that sometimes the um, the trade was so commercial that. It, uh, he was not only just sending printed books, but also just notebooks and, you know, stationery. But then they would pay back sometimes in uh, goods, not necessarily just, you know, uh, a monetary payback. And there's one where he um, trades books for cigars, um, right? And so there's this kind of, no, it's like, yes, you can send me cigars, but make sure they are Havana, you know, the Havana cigars of the best quality. So um, there was really this, this commercial trade that went on that... Uh, um, that was very much the the books were part of a of, of a uh, really part of a global network that he was trying to build. Actually, um, I, if I remember, sorry, I'm getting a text here. The um, those cigars that he got um, that were supposed to be the best Havana Habanero cigars, I think they were called. He was cheated. He he later found out. And that they were actually not very good cigars at all, and he took a complete loss on the entire shipment of cigars, which is quite large. And um, um, so, when you start looking into the um, the question of whether any of these ventures were actually profitable, um, one or two of them were, many of the others weren't. And I think you have to chalk this up to this kind of, as I say, almost globalist. Um, certainly um, not. Uh, at all confined to American American markets for, for book publishing for Americans. And a lot of other American publishers felt the same way. So what really interests me there is that's the, and that's something that I learned from you, Jim, is that the, the, the importance of this um, commercial aspect of this publication scene in early 19th century Philadelphia, because that's what allowed for the um, writers from Spanish America to really plug into that, right? In terms of um, it wasn't, you know, if I, when I first started looking at those books, I thought, oh, you know, of course you think of it's the, po the political motivations, but often it was a conjunction of those two where somebody might have an anti-colonial position, but really once they get into the uh, the uh, print culture market there, they were dealing with, um, you know, just the buying and selling of paper or something like how much does paper cost, that kind of thing. Yeah. Yeah. Wonderful. Wonderful. Um... Do you, I know we're at eight. Do you have time to answer one more question? Sure, yeah. Okay. Um, so this was part two of the question that was, or that was a sort of tangential question from the same person. Um, also, if I understand correctly, you read QSMB as an endearing signature. I wonder if this might also be read as a kind of gesture to slash signifying of the monarchical culture. I'm thinking about the argument uh, that Greg Downs makes in declarations of dependence about uh, post-Civil War politics and reproductions of monarchical culture during that time. Hmm. Yeah, no, that's a that's a, a really good um, uh, good question. I read it more as a kind of, um, uh, you know, it's it's uh, it's slightly ironic, right, in terms of, you know, their, uh, uh, you know, I kiss your hand kind of kind of thing. So, um, uh, and so if if it is invoking that, then it, it's it's doing so in an, in an ironic way, in the same way that um, it's a, almost like a play on, on the intimacy of the two people sharing the letters. So that's a yeah, yeah, that's a really, uh, a really good, uh, really good point. And um, and the other thing is, you know, most a lot of these um, salutations and uh, and and the way these letters are framed sometimes can uh, are are people playing right with language and playing uh, with um, with a sense of 
what what can I say here and what can I not say? Wonderful. Well, thank you so much, um, Dr. Lasso, and thank you all very much for coming tonight. Um, we hope you'll tune in for a future fireside chat. Um, I've put some options of ways that you can stay connected to the Library Company of Philadelphia uh, in the Zoom chat as well. So feel free to click on some of those links. Um, thank you as well, Jim, uh, for chiming in and for uh, introducing Dr. Lasso. Um, I hope everyone has a wonderful night. Stay warm uh, if you're over here on the East Coast with us, if you're yeah. in thank San Thank you, Francisco. thank you very much to everybody.